uh, first of all, I'll introduce myself since I don't know some of you in the audience. My name is Mike Verneris. I came here three years ago uh, from the University of Minnesota to head up the pediatric uh, BMT group. And so Elisa uh, Lee Sherrick is um, a faculty member in my group. Um, I'm kind of doing this from memory, but uh, I think I'll do it right. Um, so Elisa uh, did her undergraduate and uh, medical school work uh, at the University of Minnesota, so she's a golden gopher. Uh, she then um, did her internship, um, was it internship in residency or just internship? Internship in Orange County and residency. Okay, so internship in Orange County and then residency in, uh, at, uh, in Portland, and then came uh, here where she stayed on uh, as a fellow in pediatric hematology, oncology, and BMT, and stayed on as a faculty member. Um, I've actually had the pleasure of knowing Elisa for 20 years. So I, I've actually known Elisa, I think, for about 20 years. Um, and I think uh, really the, the point of my introduction today is really to uh, remind everybody, especially the PIs, but also um, the postdocs and graduate students uh, in the audience, that when this uh, uh, energetic uh, little undergraduate shows up in your office and really wants to take on the world, um, sometimes they can. And that's what Elisa's done. Um, you know, since uh, she's been a faculty member, she's gotten a V Foundation, she's got an Ash Scholar Award, which is more competitive than an NIH grant, and she now has a, a KOA and is on her way to, to really a, a rising star. And so what she's going to talk about is this very interesting molecule called MER-TK and how it is a, a tumor-suppressive molecule expressed by tumor-associated macrophages, both in uh, liquid and solid tumors. And so again, one more time, when that little medical student or that little undergraduate shows up in your office all excited, sometimes support them because uh, she spent a lot of time in my lab working really hard. So yeah, I, I didn't even know how to pipette. I didn't even know what a pipette was when I went to uh, meet Dr. Verneris. So uh, yeah, anyhow, um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the exciting work that we're currently doing in our lab, including some new data that has only a few replicates. So bear with me on some of the data. Um, and I wanted to just show you um, some of the previous things that we've done and some of the newer things um, that we're trying to figure out and get done. So the title of my talk is Immunosuppression via Ephrocytosis in the Tumor Microenvironment. And I know that, you know, most of the time I feel like when I give this talk, it's to a majority audience of immunologists. And so I understand that most of you probably don't really understand half of the title. So we'll go through that. Um, but first, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sort of the idea and my passion. And um, obviously, I'm a bone marrow transplanter. That's how I work with Mike. Um, we do bone marrow transplant uh, and cellular therapy in our division. And as a pediatric uh, physician, the exciting thing is that our patients usually live a lot longer than the adult patients do, just saying. Um, but overall, as you sort of look at this, is sort of an outdated graph, but it sort of gives you an idea of how overall pediatric cancers have really improved. This black line is like an average. But this red line is acute myeloid leukemia. I mean, that's like abysmal. It's actually a little bit better these days with transplantation and some of the other um, new regimens that we have, including um, sort of copying some of the uh, work from the elderly adults from Dan Pollier. But nonetheless, still hovering at about 65% overall survival for pediatric acute myeloid leukemia. So for me, that sort of gives me a little bit of feeling like, you know, we have to do something. We have to make this better. And not only is it only a 65% survival rate, but it's really, we have to give them extremely toxic medications to get them through this. Luckily, children are extremely, extremely resilient, and the medications we, or the chemotherapies we give children would not be tolerated in almost any adult patient. So we're lucky in that regard. However, um, I know that we can do better. So looking forward to that, my putting on my two hats as I want to be a researcher. And I also am really excited about the idea of using the immune system. That's initially why I went into Dr. Berneris' lab, because he was doing this really cool sci-fi stuff with NK cells. So how could I use this cool idea, this sort of like sci-fi immunotherapy idea, where we take this tumor that's, can you guys see this? Hopefully you can see it. Yeah. 
um, you this very um, immune suppressive tumor, even if a you know solid or liquid tumor, where it's really you know sort of not even just the tumor itself that's immunosuppressive, immunosuppressive, but it's also sort of teaching the immune system to also in turn be immune suppressive and further allow the tumor to grow. So we've taken this first little step on finding some antigen where we can target, we can engineer T cells and target the tumor and try to eliminate the tumor using T cells, but there really has to be another way because obviously CAR T cells and some T cell directed therapy doesn't always work. So I'm sort of trying to work on this next step, which is incorporate other, some of the other cells that are part of the tumor immune microenvironment, including tumor-associated macrophages. This up here you can see is probably, they're probably trying to show a, a dendritic cell vaccine or something or another. But in any event, how can we sort of incorporate other cells of the immune system that we know are in the microenvironment and maybe further um, suppressing even T-cell-directed therapy? So the problem with AML, quite frankly, compared to the successes we've had here with CAR T cells in B cell leukemia is that B cells express CD19, so do B cell leukemias. We can target CD19 easily, and then if we take out their B cells longer term, we can replace their B cell function more or less, don't hate me B cell people out there, with IVIG. But we can't really do that with AML. It's so heterogeneous. There's like, I just put this up here, not like you should actually read all of it, but just to be like, look at all the subtypes of AML. They're all so different. How are we gonna target AML as a disease, quote unquote, when there's like 50 different kinds with 50 different ways, you know, all these different mutations you can see here, all of these different proteins that they likely express. So going along with that, then there's also, you know, lack of a consistent uh, t target antigen. Basically, if we're going to target some of these mutations, well, that really limits us to a very small sliver of AML. Furthermore, um, you know, this goal of AML therapy is to give a long-term therapy that will last for a while. Unfortunately, um, some of the data, early data that they looked at with regard to CAR-Ts on CD33 and CD123 is that there's dim expression on a lot of blasts. So if there's dim antigen expression, that means likely or possibly the CAR T cell will either not engage or will have limited survival proliferation. And then also the issue of a lot of AML cells or blasts um, simply overexpress normal proteins. So hard to really target some of these normal proteins unless we're using it, as you can see, this last line as a bridge to transplant, meaning that they, you know, if we target CD33, we're going to have long-term neutropenia and other cytopenias and for that reason, you know, you can't live without neutrophils. So this really would only be a bridge to another curative therapy. So with that in mind, also thinking about the AML cells themselves, obviously I saw that, I showed that other little picture that showing that the AML cells themselves have been known to secrete a number of very T cell suppressive cytokines and other proteins as well as less well-described processes where cell turnover and expression of phosphatidylserine on leukemia cells leads to this very, in, in my opinion, very interesting immunosuppressive process called ephrocytosis. And that's what I'll mostly be focusing on today. As you can see here, this is just sort of a general idea of like ineffective hematopoiesis. The leukemia cells are growing out of control, really leads to a quick cell turnover and then increased expression of phosphatidylserine, which is this uh, green on this picture. So my question in sort of starting my research um, leaving my old mentor, starting my new research, is there an antigen-independent process that we can target in acute leukemia to override immunosuppression? And so just as a quick overview, I'm going to take you through what is ephrocytosis, and specifically I'll be talking about ephrocytosis through a specific tyrosine kinase called MRTK, and how ephrocytosis is promotes immune tolerance and therefore helps tumors continue to grow uh, and proliferate. I'll show you at least some of our research showing that inhibition of MRTK uh, in leukemic mice has altered checkpoint receptor expression, which we'll get into a little bit, and cytokine profiles, and then further inhibition of MRTK in cancers, more generally, may be useful to decrease immune evasion. 
So what on earth is ephrocytosis? This is like a very detailed, overly um, small, you probably can't read a single thing on it, but this is sort of the idea of what immuno, non-immunogenic uh, removal of debris by macrophages. So this is a, a phagocytic process where initially, this, this little bubbly guy here, he's our apoptotic cell that we're gonna get rid of. And he's apoptotic probably because there was a wound or an infection and he got destroyed in the process of killing the infection. But this is actually a self cell. This is probably not actually like a bacteria. This is probably just like I was infected with something and I died in the process. Now, in order for this tissue to heal, I have to be, I have to go away. And so the macrophages come along and they're like, hey, I'm helping out. I'm wound healing. I'm getting rid of some of this old garbage. And then, you know, the new tissue can come in and, and make wonderful new organs or whatever the issue, you know, whatever is being repaired. So in any event, initially there's a find me signal, the macrophage comes in, next is the eat me signal, and we'll go through each of these steps. So first is the find me signal, which I won't get into too much, but definitely apoptotic cells are known to secrete certain um, chemokines to draw in phagocytes. And what I'll be sp focusing on most today is this eat me signal. Um, and I'll try to point out in this picture a little bit, this green here is the apoptotic cell, and this is the expressed phosphatidylserine, the flipped membrane which attracts these phagocytes. And this sort of light blue or grayish line here is the uh, phagocyte membrane with the uh, expressed phagocytic or ephrocytic receptors. And I'll be focusing a little bit more on this guy over here, uh, the TAM receptors. TAM stands for uh, tyro 3 axel and mer tk and specifically in this model, um, the TAM receptor binds through a bridging molecule, this little semicircle here called GAS6 or protein S, um, to the phosphatidylserine. And this process really leads from an activated macrophage, pulls it into more of an M2 sort of wound healing, um, anti-autoimmunity type of uh, response by the macrophage. You can maybe see here IL-10 and TGF-beta both go up, and those are both T-cell suppressive cytokines. So really this whole process is, uh, this eat me process is I'm going to tether you, I'm going to pull you in, and then I'm going to express a bunch of immunosuppressive cytokines, really both removal of antigen, so getting rid of self-antigen, and then also spitting out a bunch of cytokines that suppress the T-cells from getting activated. And the whole premise, and this is the post-engulfment, and that's further um, immunosuppressive signaling pathways. So really this whole process, the whole idea, is to prevent autoimmunity in the setting of wound healing. So you have a wound or an infection, you need to clean up the process. Well, why don't I just both remove the antigen, the self-antigen, so that we don't have some sort of self-antigen response, and then also spitting out a bunch of T-cell suppressive cytokines. So that is really what ephrocytosis is, the focus on T-cell suppression while sort of removing some of this old debris. And why is this relevant? Why did I just learn a little immunology for five seconds? Um, well, I'll be focusing today on some of these molecules, and specifically the prototypical ephrocytosis receptors, MER-TK. And the whole idea, at least the whole background on MER-TK, um, has all been studied in the setting of, of infection. So people who took macrophages and stimulated them with LPS or stimulated with bioparticles, um, Staph aureus or Helminth or some other fun thing to do um, in a Petri dish found that they thought that these um, signaling pathways were all affected. Here's our abundant apoptotic cells triggering through MER-TK, which then upregulate SOX1 and 3, further inhibiting TLR, um, NF-kappa-B upregulation, and really putting over, and, and also I guess they didn't show here, um, this uh, SOX1 and 3 would further in inhibit uh, STAT1. So, Overall, the idea is when in the setting of infection, MER-TK really uh, functions to settle down the immune response. You know, hey, our infection's over, now it's time to wound heal, um, which I just went over. Upregulation of SOX1-3, which inhibits jack stack signaling, and inhibition of NF-kappa-B pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine signaling. 
So as I have sort of mentioned, MER-TK activation really confers this M2 polarization. So whereas M1 is sort of typically thought of, I guess the generic term we use is pro-inflammatory, but really more um, sort of removal of infection, potentially tumoricidal, um, MER-TK really functions more as this M2, really anti-inflammatory, really trying to do wound healing. And then I guess the question came up, you know, is it really tumor promoting? Does MER-TK actually uh, promote tumors um, in some capacity? So this is actually an f- uh, interesting little lesson for the grad students out there. This is a cartoon from a review that has no actual data to support it. I thought that was so interesting. Many people have cited this exact picture as so-and-so said that it does this, and there's actually no data to support it. So here I am just showing you this very cool picture that's actually my hypothesis, but has actually not previously really been shown. So in any event, um, uh, apoptotic cell signals through MER-TK has our bridging molecules, uh, GAS-6 or protein S here, leads to inhibition of NF-kappa-B, and overall leading to upregulation of immunosuppressive TGF-beta and IL-10. Now, let's say we knock out MER-TK. Well, now we can signal through NF-kappa-B, leading to sort of more of this M1-activated CD8s. Yeah, we're going to go knock out something. Um, so I guess when it came to me, I sort of wanted to look at this juxtaposition or this balance beam of M1 versus M2 within the tumor microenvironment. Um, and M2 sort of being like, hey, I'm, I'm, I think I'm wound healing right now. I think this cancer sure seems like an infection or something similar to that. So I'm going to come along and I'm going to suppress some T cells and I'm really going to help this wound grow. But really, it's actually cancer cells. Unfortunately, um, that prevents the immune system from working, right? But if we sort of knock out those signals, then all of a sudden we can really amp up those macrophages and get them to turn more of an M1 phenotype. Um, Potentially, I think the exciting thing, uh, like in, no, not here today, but um, the exciting thing is not just sort of inducing an immune response to cancer, but also potentially in solid tumor models or even in leukemia where it's, I mean, it's everywhere, you can get this subscopal effect where like, hey, I had a little local reaction right here, but now that reaction can spread because I've given memory to T cells, et cetera. So um, there, prior to my starting this, there was one study uh, by Rebecca Cook and JCI, and she put some tumors into wild-type mice, some breast cancers into wild-type mice, and then some into tumor knockout mice. And she thought there was a decreased growth and metastasis due to this pro-inflammatory tumor microenvironment. <laughs> So my research premise is, hey, in the setting of leukemia, I actually have all the things necessary for aphrocytosis. I have increased cell turnover. The cells are already growing like crazy. There's tons of antigen. There's tons of phosphatidylserine around. How is this not super relevant? How is aphrocytosis not super relevant in the setting of leukemia? Um, And as MER-TK is the prototypic aphrocytic receptor, Well, my hypothesis is that MER-TK signaling attenuates the leukemia-specific T-cell response and facilitates immune evasion. Wow, that's probably a mouthful for most of you guys. So I'm going to turn it on its head a little bit. Oh, there's the picture. Turn it on its head a little bit. So when I inhibit MER-TK, then I can actually boost the immune response. Potentially, at least in my initial questions, through NF-kappa-B, through increasing the activation of NF-kappa-B, and then also by suppressing these sort of suppressive cytokines through the release of or the decreased production of SOX1 and 3. That was my initial hypothesis. That's what I thought was going on because, hey, that's what seems to be going on in these infection models. So, oh, this is a little picture I made. So here the idea is that MER-TK... Um, really on these macrophages, engages with this uh, cancer cell that has tons of phosphatidylserine overexpressed on it, leads to inhibition of NF-kappa B uh, inflammation, and leads to upregulation of SOX1 and 3, therefore inhibiting STAT1, and potentially that also might lead to some alteration in checkpoint ligands. If I inhibit MER-TK, now I can actually promote NF-kappa B. So lots of fun inflammatory cytokines that might be available. This was my initial hypothesis, at least. And then also signaling through STAT1 would be available. 
Um, so, interestingly and excitingly for me, um, not only is there an, an animal model, but there is also an orally bioavailable MRTK inhibitor um, as listed here. This is actually one from um, clinicaltrials.gov in solid or solid tumors. Um, and excitingly, I helped uh, with the development of this particular inhibitor. So some of my early work as a fellow, at least, you can see these little pie graphs. The majority of our patients, specifically adult patients, but also in pediatric patients, actually overexpressed MRTK. And so when I manipulated it using SHRNA, as you can see by these dashed lines, compared to either scramble or wild type, there was extension of survival. So there was something about these AML cells themselves that, you know, baby myeloid cells are not supposed to express this, but these blasts did, and when I altered it, or when I turned off MER-TK, I actually found extension of survival. And then also using the TKI that we had, this is an earlier version of the currently um, clinically available TKI, I also found extension of survival. And these are all in NSG mice, but interestingly, this, um, the signaling I thought might potentially be the same in macrophages through ERK-1, 2, AKT, and STAT signaling. So <clears throat> sort of exciting, hey, I did this other project and now I get to use the same molecule and also a molecule that I developed. Um, so I guess my idea was like, hey, I already know a ton about MER-TK. I now know about this process that MER-TK does in sort of physiologic conditions. Um, why don't I try to use this to boost the immune response in mice? And what I specifically did, since I knew from my previous study, that these MER-TK expressing cancers are definitely going to die if I inhibit MER-TK in these mice. So I specifically found several AML models that are syngeneic and BLAC6, and I basically chose them because they don't express MER-TK. So I could really look at the effect of inhibiting MER-TK on macrophages. So I took wild-type mice, and I either treated them with a TKI, or in some of these models, I also have a, a MER knockout mouse. And initially, we just did some initial studies just to look at survival. And this particular model, this AML model, I found when I uh, treated with the TKI, definitely an extension of survival. And then in these knockout mice, I mean, like nobody died. And then we got these really exciting Lysim cream or flocks mice. Well, we bred them, but, and we had one mouse death, and that was like over, I can't remember which holiday, but that was a mouse that died suddenly and did not have uh, evidence of leukemia as far as we could tell, but was not checked, so we will continue to keep him on our curve. Nonetheless, I guess the idea is when I inhibited MER-TK, something happened because when I put it in this knockout model, um, definitely there is an increased activation of macrophages. This is not just something associated with the leukemia. We also looked at several different types of leukemia, very, very aggressive mouse model C1498. Um, there was even extension of survival with that model, which is very exciting, because if you guys ever worked with this, it is one of the most aggressive tumors I've ever worked with in a mouse. And then same thing, putting in it, um, this is actually one little replicate of a C1498 and a knockout mouse. And then also I looked at a primary mouse leukemia and found extension of survival. We also, um, just because the idea is leukemia, high cell turnover, um, not being just exclusive of AML, we also looked at some AML, ALL models, a very aggressive ALL, that's a ARFNL P158. Um, it's like a, a pH um, positive leukemia. And that was also MER-TK negative, and we did the same thing, knockout, mo knockout mouse, TKI. We even did a couple little manipulations where we started the treatment a little bit later and still found extension of survival. So that this was definitely having some effect on the immune system or the immune reaction uh, to the leukemia. So next what we did was we tried to figure out what exactly is going on during that time. We gave the mice leukemia, we treated them, and then we harvested them before they were ready to die. We harvested them just to look at some of their leukemia infiltrating tissues, mainly the marrow and the spleen. And then we also looked at some of their serum cytokines. And so basically, initially what I'll do is I'll go over some of these checkpoint markers, um, because at the time, this is like so hot right now. Um, but nonetheless, as you can see here, I have uh, PDL2 up in this top quadrant and PDL1 expression along this axis. So this quadrant really is the double expressors. These guys are PDL1 positive, these are PDL2 positive. And what you can see here is these are just regular mice. They don't have leukemia, they just got saline for funsies. Uh, these middle, where do we go? 
these guys have leukemia and they also got saline. And these guys got AML and RTKI that is dissolved in saline. And what you can see here, both pictorially and also graphically, is that there's a, um, so I'm gonna go over these again, no leukemia, these are leukemia mice that got vehicle, and then these are TKI treated leukemic mice. And what you can see by these top bubbles here, both in the spleen and marrow, is that those mice that had leukemia were treated with saline really had an upregulation of PDL1 and PDL2 on those macrophages or on the leukemia associated macrophages. And on this, the mice that were treated with TKI, the MER inhib inhibition, there really wasn't any much PDL1, PDL2 expression to speak of. And even just sort of parsing those out into individual PDL1 and PDL2 expression, not just looking at co expression, that the, the trends were still exactly there. Um, we took this also in our, in our ALL model where we also not just looked at, these are our TKI treated mice over here. There was a leukemia vehicle. This was a very suboptimal dose, basically didn't really inhibit MER-TK in the bone marrow. And this was our um, therapeutic dose that inhibited MER-TK in the bone marrow. So definitely you can see the same trend, decrease PDL1 and PDL2 expression. And then I'm gonna sort of run through this knockout model with you guys. Um, so here's a wild type mice, mouse, he has no leukemia wild-type mouse with leukemia. And these are, this is a regular MER-TK knockout mouse, no leukemia, and this one does have leukemia. So what you can see here is that there's a considerable upregulation of PD-L1 and PD-L2 on the macrophages in those regular normal wild-type mice when they were given leukemia. But that upregulation does not occur in the spleen or marrow in mer knockout mice. So there's some connection there between MER-TK and some of these checkpoint ligands. Um, this, I think, was exciting. We sort of did this little combination um, study where we looked at um, where we treated, uh, same thing, no leukemia, leukemia, and tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And then we looked at the MER knockout splenocytes. So theoretically, these should not have any response to the TKI if they're really, if this, basically we're trying to show that they're, these effects were not due to like some other random FLT3 inhibition or some other random off-target effect of the TKI. Really, this was all modulated through MER-TK. And what we found is there really was no change. So um, then the question became, is this just some funny phenomenon of mice that is not actually ever found in humans? So we took a couple uh, trimicones and cultured them and took, or isolated the human monocytes and treated them with human um, irradiated AML just to sort of give that apoptotic increased phosphatidylserine idea. And we found <clears throat> very similar data. This is just after um, being cultured for two days in vitro, but definitely a decrease in the pairs between those that were treated and untreated and PDL1 and PDL2 expression with this MER-TK inhibitor. Um, so then I guess my next question, I'm just going to run right on. I guess I was thinking, you know, this all runs through stat, or the all, the all, probably all this checkpoint ligand expression is probably due to um, <clears throat> some modulation of stat signaling, maybe through SOX 1 and 3. That's what all the infection literature shows. So that was my next question. Am I going to see some alteration in SOX 1 and 3? And let me tell you, the antibodies out there uh, for Western blotting in SOX 1 and 3 didn't really do me very well. So if any of you guys know any Western blot SOX 1 and 3 antibodies, great. Come talk to me. Um, but we did some qPCR. And this is just at 12 hours. But even at 24 hours, there was really no alteration. So I'll run you through these guys. These are wild-type mice, and they got vehicle. These are wild-type mice treated with the TKI. These are wild-type mice treated with AML, or added AML cells. And these are mer knockouts. And really, we didn't find any alteration in the messenger RNA uh, expression. Um, obviously, these are very limited replicates. I think this is an NF2. N of one, N of two. So nonetheless, I'm thinking, oh man, I have this whole plan and it's falling through. Now, granted, I've maybe only done this once or twice, but um, I started thinking to myself, what else could be potentially, what else is the story? I mean, I have this pretty little picture here of this um, tyrosine kinase, well, potentially either a cytokine receptor or tyrosine kinase showing jack stat signaling inhibited by SOX. I decided to take, a, you know, previously I'd shown that MER-TK inhibits STAT-6. What if MER-TK like somehow directly or very closely inhibits STAT-1 without all the rigmarole 
of SOX 1 and 3. And so we did a Western blot. And again, I beg for forgiveness because I really like clean Western blots. But nonetheless, this is um, <clears throat> just sort of showing you these are wild type mice without leukemia, vehicle treated, uh, MER TKI inhibited. Mm, um, and, and these are wild type mice, MER TK knockout with AML and MER TK knockout. And potentially, I think what we saw is there might be, this again was just one replicate, but um, an increased uh, phosphorylation um, of a STAT1. And that didn't necessarily make a ton of sense, but we're trying to figure out this signaling mechanism right now. Uh, the next thing we looked at with regard to some of the, the next, I guess, question was NF-kappa B signaling. So we looked at our serum cytokines for our mice that we had treated, and we found very clearly, I mean, we did this huge panel and really two hashed out. And one of those was IL-18, a known macrophage activation marker, a known M1 macrophage activation marker, and then interferon gamma. And just to make sure that this wasn't due to, like, tumor volume, we cultured our AML cells plus or minus the TKI, and definitely IL-18 goes down in our AML cells. So this phenomenon of increased IL-18 did not appear to be due to the AML cells. And the same thing with interferon gamma. There really was not an increased um, expression of interferon or suppression of NF-kappa B, or of um, interferon gamma. Sorry about that. So um, then also looking... Not sure how big this is. Um, you know, was this just a phenomenon of tumor volume or some other funny little thing? We decided to look, and then I guess the other question is: Is this T cell effect? Is this macrophages producing interferon gamma? Not entirely clear. So we took um, some uh, C11B macrophages, cultured them for a couple of days, and then treated them with um, with or without the TKI and uh, leukemia cells. And as you can sort of maybe see here, I guess it's a little smaller than I had intended. And this, again, is just uh, one little tiny replicate, but we'll see where it goes. Um, a definite, when they are treated with TKI, these macrophages, isolated macrophages, definitely have increased mRNA expression of interferon gamma. Interestingly enough, a couple that were too low to be detected in our Luminex, this is all Luminex here, um, our Luminex actually there was increased messenger RNA of IL-1 beta and IL-12, sort of showing that there was this increased inflammatory cytokine, at least mRNA um, production. So um, previously I had done a couple Western blots looking at NF-kappa B phosphorylation. And Man, let me tell you, those antibodies are also not the best. Um, here's one of them. Um, but really, I didn't see much difference. Maybe it's the antibody that's not super spectacular. But then this article came out, and what they had found, and this is a generic picture I stole from somebody else, but really they found that it's this interplay between the P65 and the P50 that leads to translocation into the nucleus that leads to this increased inflammation. And when there's excessive P50, that prevents the uh, production of inflammatory cytokines by whatever way, whether that's prevention of translocation or whether that's just sort of binding elsewhere um, not entirely sure, but they thought for sure this is because MER-TK leads to this alteration in this ratio. And what we found, at least, you know, we didn't really see a ton with our phospho because the antibody was really terrible. But definitely when MER-TK was inhibited, we found an increase in total P65, as you can see here. This isn't the best one, but... And also in our knockout mice that had exposure to AML. So potentially... Um, what MER-TK does at baseline, at least what this article is saying, is that the, it increases the expression of P50 um, so that there's all these homodimers of P50 preventing inflammatory cytokine um, production. And when MER-TK is inhibited, total P65 increases so that there's more of these heterodimers leading to translocation into the nucleus and subsequent inflammatory cytokine production. Um, interestingly enough, we did not see, and this is um, our uh, RT-PCR data of P100, which is cleaved to make P50. So we didn't necessarily see any change in P50, but potentially it's um, associated with a change in total P65. Still working this out. 
So in any event, up to this point, my conclusions are that MER-TK inhibition might be beneficial in decreasing leukemia-associated immune evasion, specifically through myeloid-derived cells, these tumor-associated macrophages, um, both by decreasing PD-L1 and PD-L2 co-inhibitory expression, and then also through some inflammatory cytokine production. So moving on, um, maybe phagocytosis takes care of leukemia by itself, but probably we need some T cells to help us out. So the next part of my study looked at some indirect effects of T cells. And I, um, here we go. This is what I want you to look at first. So initially what we did was we're like, okay, do T cells actually express more TK? I don't think so. There's some study that came out there like after 7 to 14 days of stimulation with anti-CD3 28 beads, maybe there's a little bit of more TK expression on these cells. But what we found, not only in the dish, but also when co-cultured with leukemia or when these mice were given leukemia, there was no increased expression of more TK on T cells, on CD3 lymphocytes. So we did not necessarily believe that MER-TK is expressed on T cells. Therefore, the majority of any of these, any effects that we saw on T cells had to be mediated through this effect, through this macrophage. So what we did was we took our AML model and we put our leukemia into TCR alpha mice or wild type mice, B6 is wild types. Uh, and then we also did the same where we treated them with an anti-CD8 antibody. And what you can see is that the extension of survival um, that the tyrosine kinase inhibitor conferred to the wild-type mice was de mouse was definitely decreased. So indicating, at least in my mind, same thing here, indicating at least in my mind, like, Definitely phagocytosis has something to do with it, but to get the full boost, the full immune boost from inhibiting MER-TK, you need both, you know, myeloid and T cell components. Um, and then just to further sort of show that same idea, we in our ALL model, we put these into nods gamma mice, um, which lacks T cells. And again, there was no extension of survival in our ALL model. So how, what's exactly happening? Why is it T cells? Well, obviously, we had shown that there was some change in these um, PDL1, PDL2 co inhibitory receptors. Well, what about some ligands on T cells? So, we did our same little thing where we injected mice, gave them leukemia, then we treated them and harvested them um, about a couple weeks in, about three weeks in. And looking, this column here is CD4s, this column here is CD8s. And what you can see is definitely with the CD4s, there's an upregulation of PDL1 here in both the spleen and marrow, and an upregulation of TIM3 in both the spleen and marrow on CD4s, and that is um, decreased back to or even less than sort of these non-leukemic mice um, when treated with the TKI. Not as exciting with the CD8s, but you would imagine that if these are macrophage interacting with um, T cells, probably the CD8s are the more interested party. Um, and so in the marrow, definitely an upregulation of PDL1 and, uh, I'm sorry, PD1 and TIM3, but not so much in the spleen. And then in, in any event, um, we repeated this or a similar study in our ALL mice and found that um, same thing. When treated with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, the upregulation of PD1 was significantly decreased. Same with our knockout mice. These are wild types. These are wild types with leukemia in both CD4s and CD8s, definitely an increase in PD1. And then equivocal expression of PD1 um, in the MER knockout mice. Um, sort of taking a step further in our ALL study, we haven't done this yet in our AML work, um, but looking specifically at this interplay between is there more TK on T cells? What's happening with the T cells? Are they getting excited? Are they not getting excited? And I'm going to try to sort of draw your, uh, your eyes to these green boxes here. Um, the whole idea that we saw here, these are wild type CD4s. And these are MER-TK knockout CD4. So showing that this TKI still had an effect on increasing interferon gamma and uh, TNF-alpha, even when MER-TK was not present on T cells. So indicating this might be more of a downstream pathway uh, rather than a direct effect. Because you can see here in these blue spots, these are non-leukemic MER-knockout T cells and leukemic knockout T cells. Uh, there really was no alteration Really, the only change was when uh, those mice were treated with the TKI, and it was irrespective of MER-TK expression on T cells. So 
Coming back to my conclusions, we talked a little bit about the tumor-associated macrophage effects. Now moving on to the downstream effects that could be potentially somehow related to this alteration in checkpoint cytokines or maybe additional other interactions. Um, there's definitely a decrease in some of these T-cell exhaustion markers, PD-1 and TIM-3. So looking back at those mechanisms, I don't know that I necessarily showed any evidence towards macrophage activation via NF-kappa B, but I don't think that, um, at least from the couple things that we've done, I don't necessarily know that MER-TK on mac tumor-associated macrophages routes through SOX1 and 3 like it does in some of these infection models. So I think what we will pursue at this time is looking a little bit more on how MER-TK and MER-TK inhibition modulate STAT signaling, sort of more of a direct inhibition or alteration um, on um, STAT suppressive signaling. So the next steps for me in my lab. Um, obviously, what I think would be really cool is if we take some of our, this isn't something that's just going to work maybe all by itself, but really would be an amazing boost in connection with T-cell-directed therapy. Um, so, and I have these two buddies, one NK-cell guy over there, one T-cell, car T-cell guy that is a couple doors down from me, Terry Fry, um, potentially using this in the setting of um, boosting the uh, T cell response in CAR T cells or something similar. Um, I guess the other question is in the setting of hypototic flux, where can I, where is atherocytosis actually interesting or important? Well, obviously, atherocytosis is important in a setting where there's lots of apoptotic cells. So, what does that mean? Well, maybe after chemotherapy or after radiation, something where there's a high flux of apoptotic cells um, where MERTK is overexpressed. I guess the other um, thing that we haven't talked uh, at very much about is in the setting of chemotherapy, we know that MER-TK is upregulated after glucocorticoid administration. And what do you know? Um, steroids are part of ALL induction therapy in pediatrics. So potentially that would be another place where we could really boost our immune response. Um, the use of MER-TK inhibition and other tumor types, not just liquid tumors. Obviously, the whole idea, the whole reason I got excited about this is because it's antigen independent. It doesn't matter about a specific antigen. It really looks at a process. So are there other tumor types that have the same process, and could we harness some of our, um, our knowledge about MER-TK and, and its inhibition in these uh, solid tumor models, which I'll show you a slide of a young lady in my lab, Jane, um, who's done a lot of work in this area. Um, and then I think some exciting things is that we recently got a hold of a couple um, MER-TK flux models. Previously, all we had available were these generalized knockout mice where there might be some effects of ephrocytosis on endothelial cells or NK cells. And we can really, with these models, focus in a little bit better on the macrophages effect. So... I'm just going to show you real quick a little bit of information about these other tumor models, specifically the rhabdomyosarcoma that Jane Koo's been working on. And what she found, um, if the, at least this was a flank model, we put some of these rhabdo cells into the flank, we started administering either the uh, MER-TK inhibitor or saline, and overall compared tumor volumes and overall survival. So interesting, like what she found was at a certain point, definitely the saline mice had their tumor outgrowth, whereas this was blunted quite a bit by the MER-TK inhibitor. However, there really wasn't an extension in survival. So, you know, is this, there, this is a colder tumor? Is this really because these cells don't express a ton of uh, phosphatidylserine? Not entirely clear, but our next step is to assess this in a post-chemotherapy and eventually a post-radiation therapy model of both murine rhabdo and neuroblastoma. <coughs> so with that, I'll head to my acknowledgement slides. Obviously, the majority of this work was done by two amazing young ladies, uh, Kristen Allison and Lauren Page, who has since gone on to med school at um, University of Utah, and then Jane, um, who's a fellow in my lab and is um, working on the solid tumor models, and then my amazing group of mentors um, who have helped guide me um, in this fun little game. In addition to my previous mentor, Doug Graham, and some of the ALL work was done by Kristen Jacobson and Curtis Henry. Carla Rothelin gave us those Merflox mice, and we get our drug free of charge from Merex. So those are my funding sources. As Dr. Bernaris mentioned, um, I have an Ash Scholar, a K-8, a V Foundation, and um, some previous funding that has helped me along the way. 
So with that, I'll take questions. James. So, very interesting. So with the clinical trials that you talked about, could you give us a little more insight into those? And then are they, are, is it merging it combined with chemo? And of course, do you have access to any sin? Oh, it's such a good question. So these are older people generally with head and neck cancers. I think they've recruited like five people, and I don't, I have not had access to t tumor samples, but super good suggestion. We probably need to pursue that. Um, and I think initially it was, um, the whole marketing initially was really as a cytolytic against cancer. And now I think they're sort of like, well, we can look at some other stuff too. So that's good. So um, super good question. Actually, Jane, who just left, um, is going to end up looking at some of those. Um, I guess um, at the time, there was a bit of, um, how do I say this in a politically correct way? Some people really felt strongly about some markers. Other people felt strongly about other markers. And really what it comes down to is function. And so that's why we started just being like, hey, I'm going to look at SOX, cytokines, some of the other like real actual, I know this is doing an M1 or an M2 thing rather than like, does it have scavenger receptors? You know, just to be a bit more clear about exactly what's going on. I think the other thing is that we found one of these interesting things about at least our leukemia-associated macrophages is that they really sort of do this funny little thing where we think about M1 and M2 as like totally different places, but really there's like overlaps, all kinds of overlaps, and so then it really just does come down to function. So I am super glad you asked that. Actually, um, we looked at it with our AL... Oh, I didn't include it. Shoot. Um, darn it. Um, I, we did look at it at our ALL stuff, and I didn't include it because we haven't looked at it at all in our AML, but definitely there was an alteration in Tregs. And I think um, some people thought, oh, this is tumor volume. But even when we gave like a little whiff of MERTK inhibition, there still was a significant decrease in Tregs. So I'm not sure what that interplay is. And I actually, um, we're still trying to figure out like IL-10 or TGF-beta, like what happens with our immunosuppressive cytokines. I, I'm not entirely sure, and I don't know that it's going to be consistent across every single tumor model. But I think our neuroblastoma stuff will probably will look at T regs too. Yeah. Super good question. So um, I guess initially some of the um, issues that I had was that everyone always uses like the uh, like a positive control that may be like a di you know like LPS. It's not. It's all run through TLR four. So I guess I was sort of trying to parse that: is this through TLR nine or is this some other sort of signaling pathway? Where how am I really going to induce that? So maybe I I mean maybe that's what we'll try. Um, but yeah. It's, it's trying, it's like this little line between like, should I just do it like everybody else does it or should I like try to make it super clean? So, anyway. Yeah. Just because of the, it's inducible, and in our knockout mouse, we found that it expresses crap tons of IL-10 to sort of like chill itself out. Um, I actually don't mind the DCs coming out. Like, they're so little compared to the macrophages that it, like, I didn't feel like I needed to parse out that 0.5%. But I guess the reason is emergency case on the DCs. There's a lot of people show that Myeloid DCs. Yeah, and, and I also feel like there's a bunch of, like, super disparate um, data. One of the articles that I showed about the P50 dimers also said that they didn't believe that DCs express MERTK. I'm like, oh, for the love of God, here we go again. But, um, but so, I, I, like, at first I tried to, like, parse out some of the DCs from the tumor and macrophages, and it just felt like there was just too much overlap, and so I just included them, and I was calling them tumor-associated macrophages. For a while I was calling them antigen-presenting cells, you know, like... It's hard to actually get enough data on this little tiny population. But it's a good question, nonetheless. Honestly, it's because of the inducibility. It sort of mimics the TKI a little bit better. So if I just 
turn it on and turn it off works a little bit closer than having this chronic inflammation. And how is that affecting the leukemia? I don't know. Yeah. So Lisa, I, I found the, uh, the effect on PDL2 really impressive, more so than PDL1. Um, so do you know whether the drug can either actively downregulate the expression of PDL2 on cells that are already high, or did it simply prevent PDL2 from being used? So, um, so let's see. So the cells that are already high. So we did that in a, some of our AML cells. And I really am, for this talk, was trying to focus on the macrophages. But definitely when we had our AML cells, they already have a ton of PDL1 or PDL1 and PDL2. And that downregulated them. Just culture, just sitting in culture for a day or two. So it did do that. And, and it's interesting you, you sort of point out the difference in PDL1, PDL2. Actually, um, the other difference that I noted that I didn't put down here is that um, it's the PDL1 is sort of like a little tiny shift in a population that already expresses PDL1. It's more MFI change, whereas the PDL2 is like a totally new population or a missing population. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's pretty insightful with regards to delineating the mechanism by which this occurred, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so interestingly, some have speculated it's a uh, STAT6, which we couldn't find in our macrophages, but I previously showed in the AML model that MERTK regulates STAT6. So for me, that was the link, and then we just couldn't get the stupid antibodies to work. So. Uh, that's not like we are currently working on optimizing, like we just did the first run of that panel, looking at both MHC1 and 2, mostly 2, but yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys.